Well, good morning. How is everybody? Somewhat awake? Uh, my name is Robert Chigl. I'm with Victor Technologies Training. And if you look on the, uh, uh, the agenda, this is about mastery-based blended learning, which I don't know if it really means anything to you, but hopefully it will by the end of the presentation. Uh, I, I, I love following David because AWS is doing a lot of the things that we've sort of discovered in, in a direction that we're moving as a, as a company for our internal training, for our distributor training, our sales training. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And really the overall focus uh, of what this presentation is all about, I want to uh, share with you. So let's just get into it. First off, let me talk about who I am. Um, Robert Shigley, I'm the uh, Senior Training Manager for Victor Technologies. Uh, our, our department, um, well, I'll talk to you about what we do in just a minute, but uh, uh, my background, in one way or another, I've been involved in training for uh, about 20 years. So I started in the Navy in advanced electronics and submarines, and I taught at Radio Main A School. Uh, I had a stint in financial services for five and a half years, and a lot of that was sales training uh, based. And then I worked for a computer uh, learning center, New Horizons Computer Learning Center, teaching software. So I've spent a lot of time teaching, uh, teaching folks and teaching adults predominantly. And then came over and took over the, uh, started in project management with Victor under new, new product uh, development and then moved over and took over the training department. So I've seen a lot of kind of how training has evolved uh, over the last 20 years. And personally, I think that there is not a more exciting time to be involved in training than right now. I think there are some, some paradigm shifts and it's almost a renaissance uh, period in terms of training. And we've got tools available, available to us as educators that, that are unprecedented, that we've never had access to before. And that's what I wanna kinda share with you and share with you um, how to really start to leverage those tools or at least our perspective on how to start to leverage those tools. Because sometimes I think um, you get in a situation where new technology comes around and your administrations want you to start using that technology, but it's kind of, okay, hey, here's an iPad, go use it. And there's really, all right, how do I get this really seamlessly or synergistically integrated into my curriculum? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about pedagogy. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the flipped classroom model that, um, that David was speaking to and um, uh, sort of what, what you can do to leverage those, uh, that technology. So our group in the training, we're responsible for uh, all of our customer facing employees. So customer care and our sales guys. We do all distributor training um, and we do all end user training as it relates to our products and some process. So that's what our, our department really does. And we also maintain a learning management system, online training. Okay, and we do a, a classroom instructor based training. So we've got sort of the whole gamut of training that we cover. And what, it, what I really want to talk to you about is how we're preparing and kind of adapting and changing the model of what we've done to get ready for the 21st century student that's coming out, the up and coming student, who really is a different student, I think. So to do that, I've got to take you a little bit inside of Victor Technologies training and share with you some of the things that, that we discovered as we first were talking about innovation and how do we really innovate our training. So one of the things I came across, have any of you ever heard of this uh, two sigma problem? Is that familiar to anyone? So this is a, a white paper that was uh, done by Benjamin Bloom. He's an educational researcher. And what he did is he took three different communities and he tried different approaches or different pedagogies in terms of how he's gonna teach. So the first one was your standard lecture class. So sort of just like this, I stand up in front, I lecture, lecture, lecture to you, and then we do testing. And they measured the results of those students, right? And that became the standard or the mean. Then they took another community, did the exact same thing, a lecture-based, but they took a mastery-based approach, meaning that you couldn't move to the next topic until you had demonstrated mastery of the existing topic. And when they did that, they saw a one sigma improvement to the overall results. So there was something to not allowing people to move forward until they had obtained mastery that got better results. Well, then they went a little bit farther and they did individual one-on-one -on -one tutoring with a mastery-based approach. So now they sat down with you one-on-one -on -one and they worked with you, worked with you, worked with you until you demonstrated proficiency and then moved on to the next topic. They saw a two-sigma improvement off of the standard lecture. 
Well, what does that really mean? Well, what it really means is if I've got uh, 120 people in a classroom, on the standard model, 50-50, right, right across, a two sigma improvement means that 98, per, 98 of those people, or 98% of those people, are gonna be above average, right, as opposed to just passing using the mastery-based individual tutoring. So when we saw that, we're like, all right, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. I mean, imagine if you could have 98% of your students coming out above average. That's a fairly compelling um, idea. But there is the two sigma problem. Because how do you afford to have individual training or individual tutoring for every single one of your students? It just isn't really practical. And that's why this has been a problem since the 80s. It's really trying to think about how do we get that that kind of attention to a student to get those kind of results without having to spend individual tutoring. So we think that technology offers an opportunity to do that. So what's important though is it's not technology by itself. All right, if it was only technology by itself, this would have happened a long time ago because technology is not all that new, right? I mean, you can go all the way back to 1969 with the ARPANET, Apple II comes out in 1977. You just sort of work your way through the path here, and you'll see, right? I mean, the first tablet came out in 1987 by Apple, the Newton, Newton tablet. So this technology has been around, and every time new technology came out, you had somebody who was a visionary in training that said, we could really revolutionize training utilizing this technology. But for some reason, it's never really happened, okay? Um, so I would argue that it's, it's not just the technology. Instead, it's the time that we're in right now. How, how many of you have heard of this, this concept, the digital immigrant uh, versus the digital native? Did David talk about it? Yes. Yeah. So, what's that? 2000. So 1975, and there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, disagreement about when, you know, when the time is. But for me, 1975, if you think about kids that were born in that time, most of those kids, by the time they hit kindergarten, had apples uh, in the school system. So they already were growing up with technology from an educational standpoint, right? And definitely after that, right, they've always had it in their, in their life. So this looks like, as I just look out here at the class, we've got quite a few digital immigrants here. I'm a digital immigrant. But what's important to me about this is this doesn't necessarily mean that you're more prone or you're more adept at technology. Because right, if you think about it, uh, it just like a, an actual immigrant, somebody who immigrates to a different country, some immigrants just want to find out everything there is about that country. And so they, they go out, they explore, and in a lot of cases, they end up knowing more about the, the country than the native does. Some immigrants want to stay in their little borough. They want to do things the way they've done back in their, you know, their home country, and they just never leave. Likewise with natives. Just because you're a digital native doesn't necessarily mean you're enamored with technology. My daughter's a, a great example. She's not particularly enamored with uh, technology. In fact, she just, she just took a trip overseas and she bought an old Polaroid camera. That's the camera that she wanted to have. So she got it from a secondhand store. She's got a cassette deck in her car and she buys old cassettes. She just, she's sort of not really into technology. However, that said, she can navigate PowerPoint, she can navigate technology as well as, as anyone because she grew up with it and to her it's a pencil. It's a tool, there's nothing really special about it, there's nothing really, you know, she knows how to set up a phone, she knows how to use all that stuff just because she's always had it. So I wanna, I wanna do something here real quick before I move on. Who can tell me, or show me rather, I've got a, a hankering for a Whopper this afternoon. Who can show me where the nearest Burger King is? Okay, let's see. First one who can show me where the nearest Burger King is, I got something for you. Half a mile. Uh, 
Here you go, sir. Here you go. I got one for you, too. And since uh, you use Siri, my favorite, uh, oops, sorry about that. So thank you. You've just demonstrated my, my next point. We've reached a tipping point. Any of you ever seen this diffusion of innovation? So any new innovation that comes out, you've got the early, uh, early adopters, right? It sort of goes up on this bell curve where you get the, uh, the early and the late majority, and then it moves to the laggards. I would argue that our industry is probably on the laggard side when it comes to technology, right? That said, in this classroom, right, I'd probably say, how many of you have a smartphone just by a show of hands? Okay, so not only do you have some of the latest technology, but as you just demonstrated, you know how to use the latest technology. And most of us are immigrants. Natives have that thing in their hand everywhere, right? We are no longer, when some of that new technology came along, we were here and trying to find people who knew the technology. That was half the battle because you were trying to teach them the technology so then you could start to use that technology to teach. We're not at that place anymore. We don't need to teach people how to use the technology. They already know how. And they're using it on a day-to-day -day basis for stuff like that, for looking up, uh, finding things, shopping. They're already using that tool all the time. So we need to start to use it. I'm telling you, we've got to change. I know this is really wordy. There's just a couple things that I want to point out. This is um, uh, a Cisco mobile data traffic executive summary report that comes out quarterly. Take a look at some of these stats. By the end of 2013, the number of mobile connected devices will exceed the number of people on Earth. And by 2017, there'll be nearly 1.4 mobile devices per capita. We've got to have 10 in my house. Mobile network connection speeds are going to increase sevenfold by 2017. Mobile connected tablets will generate more traffic in 2017 than the entire global mobile network in 2012. That's just from the tablets. And the average smartphone will gener generate 2.7 gigabytes of traffic per month in 2017. That's an eight-fold increase over 2012. So this is happening. And whether we like it or not, I, education is changing. There are all, all, all kinds of models that are leveraging this technology. Here's some of the examples. Have you guys ever heard of MOOCs? Massive uh, open online courses. So here's four of them, and uh, I'd encourage you to go take a look at these. Uh, these are university-sponsored. Some of them are independent. Khan Academy is an, uh, an independent. Coursera, Udacity, and edX are sponsored by other universities. These are online, free educational classes, college degree or college-level classes. Khan Academy actually has an entire division dedicated to the medical field. So they're publishing. Uh, college level, collegiate level information for the medical industry for free. And you can see just some of these millions served on Khan Academy, 4,300 plus videos, 31 topics, 67 courses on, on edX. Um, this is the models of the new frontier. This is the direction that we're going. We'll start leveraging and utilizing education. And we're beyond that now. Yeah, go ahead. It, 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 it absolutely is. If you haven't, it's actually one of my favorites. You're going to see some stuff here in a second. How, how many of you have heard of Khan Academy? All right. If you haven't gone up and checked it out yet, there are teacher tools that I'm going to show you in just a second that they offer for free. Yeah. Another good one on there is a TED Talks. TED Talks is great. TED Talks has some great videos. Actually, TED Talks is one of the places that I discovered Khan Academy is a, is a TED Talk. That's a, that's a great. So. Another indicator that this is the model of the new frontier is to follow the money. Massive amounts of money are being poured into these MOOCs, and they're not just being poured into it from uh, educational. They're coming in from venture capitalism. They're coming in from companies, private uh, nonprofits, universities. Everybody's pouring money into this methodology, and it's shaking the very foundations of, uh, of the university system. The other thing I think that uh, technology offers us as an opportunity is, is surgical grade analytics. So everybody here after your courses, do you guys do some sort of survey? You sort of, you know, how am I doing? They, they rate you on some sort of scale. 
Um, do any of you alter or change your course based on the feedback? Sometimes, maybe not, depending on what the feedback is. It's kind of hard when you've got, you know, maybe 15 kids, 20 kids in your classroom. You get some feedback. It's kind of hard to tell whether or not it's, it's something worth, you know, changing on that, you know, on that percentage. It's hard to tell whether this is just a kid who was upset about it or is this really a, a fundamental flaw in the way that you're teaching. Well, that's one of the things that technology, every industry has had the ability to do good analytics based on technology except for the teaching industry. Well, now that's starting to change. So this is just an example from some of the Coursera courses. So Coursera tracks, sort of like uh, David was talking about, they can track how much time you spend on a video, they can track you know, what your answers are, and they can analyze all this information. So this is just an example of um, a test question on a particular a t test. So this is just one test, and each X on here represents a wrong, wrong answer. The big X represents multiple wrong answers to the, same, uh, to the same question. The exact same wrong answer to the same question. So this big X up in the upper left hand represents 200 kids that answered the question wrong, but they answered it wrong exactly the same. So if you think about that, you know, if you've got two kids out of 100 that answer wrong, you may not be able to pick that up. But if you get 200 and you see something like that, that's going to stand out like a sore thumb. So what they were able to do is go in and do a root analysis on that test and find out what's the fundamental flaw. Why are people answering the same thing wrong each time? Then what they were able to do is put a pop-up on that question. So if someone answered it that way, they could immediately respond and say, well, we understand why you're thinking it that way, but here, 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 to redirect them to the, uh, to the, right, the right thinking. So real-time response to a flaw in the curriculum. That's the kind of thing that the surgical grade ana uh, analytics will allow you to do. And Khan Academy is taking it to the next level. Khan Academy provides dashboards that allow in that model that David was talking about, that flipped classroom, so much time is spent in trying to um, work with a bunch of students, right? Where really what you want to do is you want to have not just a student to teacher ratio that's good, you want to have a student to teacher effective interaction, right? So with some of these analytics that they're providing, and this is just an account that I, that I threw together to give you an example. So math is what they're really strong at. So it's got all the courses listed across here and then it's color coded by student, okay? So you can immediately see a trouble area for your student you can even dive down into that trouble area and you can see what's the problem that they're having on a particular topic. So instead of me trying to move the whole pig and a python through, you know, th through as a, as a whole class, I can individually look at who's having problems. Okay. Here's another, uh, another way that they cut it. They've got the whole class listed here with all of the uh, topics that you're covering, broken out, color coded, so you can figure out who's struggling. Another way to look at it, in terms of just uh, under one individual student and percentage as far as correct that they've got for testing on that, uh, on those particular topics. Again, another way where they've got just, you can look in a quick snapshot to see who's struggling, who understands, who's proficient, who's in review. And any one of these you can drill down and see greater, uh, greater detail. So, these kind of analytics have been available in the commercial industry for a long time. It's the first time they're really being brought to bear in the education industry. And this is what technology can do for us. Great things with the videos that we were talking about, with that flipped classroom model. Um, you have the students going through videos at home. There are analytical tools where you can actually see if they completed the video, how far in. You Google Analytics, you can actually track, and YouTube does this, you can track how far into the video they go before viewership drops off. So you can see, okay, they went, they went two minutes into the video and then they, they stopped watching. And if that's a trend, so you got 100 students that have gone through and looked at that video and they drop off at a certain point, then you can start to discern, all right, maybe there's something wrong with the video, somebody's not getting it, right? And you can modify it and update your curriculum based on the results that you're actually getting in the classroom. So with all of these tools that are available, and there are plenty, 
right? I mean, you got virtual chalkboards. Some of you have probably, have you seen the, um, the smart boards? Where it's essentially you've got dual touch interactive smart boards. It's like a big iPad on your, on your wall that you can project or you can actually use as, a, uh, as an interface. Um, blogs, webinars, standard traditional classroom te uh, teaching, podcasts, uh, lab, you got all this stuff. You've got all these ways that you can test. All right, it used to be that it was kind of a multiple choice or a fill in the blank, and those were your only options. That's not the case anymore. See some of the stuff that David is working on, gamification that you can add in. You can create games in your lesson plan that make the lessons plan more engaging. There's drag and drop exercises. There's just all kinds of stuff that you can do not just from a verbal you know, standpoint, but that you can do in an online environment. And what it does is it finally creates a place where we can really truly do blended learning. So in, in the way that we're structuring it, that whole flip model is really only the beginning. Okay, it's just one step towards trying to get to individualized lesson plans, individualized learning. And really for us, what we want to do is we want to take the stuff that you don't get a lot of benefit by having somebody lecture to you, right? If I stand up here and I lecture and I give you facts and figures and statistics and history and just sort of rote information, there's not a lot of benefit that we're, that we're getting. You're just sort of passively listening, and if that happens to be one of your learning styles, then that's great. You're getting a, you know, a lot of information, but there's probably better ways that I could get that information to you Right, that doesn't take up valuable classroom time. Where valuable classroom time comes and where an instructor is really valuable, and in the welding industry, this is, this is particularly true, is out here, right, where you start getting into project-based exercises, sort of mentoring, theoretical, complex. Okay, I kind of put it this way. It's the difference between teaching somebody what welding is versus teaching someone how to weld. Where our value comes in as instructors is the mentoring and the actual hands-on teaching and engaging with the process, not just lecturing to a, a, a static audience. That's not really where our value is, especially when we can get that out of the classroom. So I think what David was showing you is some of the results. If you take this stuff out, you give it to them as prep work beforehand, that's time that you don't have to, uh, have to waste in the classroom and you can free it up to make more engaging labs more engaging uh, information, or more engaging classroom concepts. So I'll give you a, a real-time example in our world. Um, every class that we have, whenever we have distributors in or we have sales guys in or whatever, and they're going to be doing hands-on, we have a big safety section. So that safety segment used to take up an hour to two hours, depending on who was asking questions and what have you. We shifted the entire thing to an online environment and we created a, a interactive test with it. So as a prep work, a prerequisite before you come to the class, you'd have to take this online course. And the online course is built where if you know all the safety information, you can go directly to the test and you could just test out. So you could just take the test. And for adult learners, particularly, you know, we've got people that come to our class that you may have a guy that's five months in the business and somebody who's 30 years in the business. And the problem with adults is they generally don't want to share when they don't know something. So if we're in, a, in an environment, we're talking about safety and maybe we get into some concept that they haven't really, you know, thought about for a long time. It's been a while since, you know, maybe what's the proper way to store an acetylene uh, tank. You know, if it's laid over on its side, how long is it before you need to have it standing up before you can use it? And they don't want to admit, they're a 30-year guy, they don't want to admit that maybe they don't remember that. Well, in an online environment, we have the safety quiz, and if they get to a part where they're stuck, we've got a link directly to a video that addresses that particular part that they're stuck on. So in the safety and security of their own home, right, they can go through and they're like, well, I don't really remember this. They can click out, they can refresh their memory, they can come back in, they can finish up the test. So we know that we've got that prerequisite information and what used to take us an hour and a half to two, uh, two hours, takes us 15 minutes. So it's 15 minutes in the class just to make sure everybody's, everyone's good, everyone understands the, you know, the key safety rules and we can move on. And that's given us, you know, an hour at least that now we can start to get into more of these abstract concepts. Yeah. It is. It's um, uh, the safety video, and in fact, you're all going to get it. 
um, before you leave. I've got some USB, uh, USB pins that has this whole presentation in a PDF form, and it has um, our safety video, which also has a instructor guide and a student guide for the entire safety package. So it's a safety DVD that you can actually get from us, but I put it on this USB pin for you. So how do we, how do, we do this? Well, to create space from the future, and I think this is the big thing that's, um, uh, that's missing when people are trying to adopt technology. For us, we had to blow up the model. We had to completely rethink how we, how we deliver our class. And uh, I've got a really good friend of mine. There's a, a convention that goes on that's called FlipCon. If you're interested in this course, uh, it's called FlipCon, FlipCon 14. I think this is the seventh year that they're doing it. And it's, uh, it's in Philadelphia this year. So hopefully, we're, we're going to be presenting there. Uh, she works at a community college teaching math. And she's been doing the FlipCon model for her last uh, three, uh, three semesters, the flipped classroom model. And one of the things that she discovered was when she first tried to do it, there was a lot of resistance. And it wasn't something that she could just, OK, hey, now we're going to flip the classroom. And you're going to watch some videos at home. And you're going to come in and, and, and do different stuff in the class. She basically had to rethink the whole way that she structured the class. And, and we did too, right? When we started thinking about moving towards individualized learning, started lever you know, leveraging online technology, we really had to kind of rethink the way that we built the curriculum so we could figure out what's the best technology to use. You know, you sort of got, think of it like Batman's utility belt. You know, you got all these tools available to you and so you've got to think about all the topics that you've got to deliver and ask yourself, which of these tools is going to be the best tool to use? And that required kind of moving things around, changing the way that we structured all of our, of our, of our content. And I'll kind of show you how we did it. These are the tools that we used for the rebuild. And again, this is on a presentation. I've got these uh, QR codes on, on all of them. You can scan it if you've got that app on your, uh, on your phone and it'll take you right to the site. This is just some of the software that we used to help us rethink and restructure the way that we built the, uh, the curriculum. So the first thing we used is MindJet Mind Manager, and this is just a mind mapping software, um, but it happens to be my, one of my favorite pieces of software. I use it in project management all the time whenever I'm, I'm kind of brainstorming a project. It just lets you sort of think the way that you would naturally think. You throw topics out there, and you start to build ideas off of those topics. So when we first really kind of blew up the curriculum and started rethinking it, this was the main tool that we started to use to figure out how are we going to structure the training. And then I mapped it out. What we did is we, we built an apprentice, a journeyman, and a mastery model. Okay? So we took, uh, in our case, it's across all of our brands. So we've got this breadth of, uh, of, of topics that we have to teach on. And then there's a depth. You know, so everything you're teaching has... A, a, a wide and a deep. And I really had to determine um, the wide part was pretty easy. I got to cover all of our product lines, but then I had to determine how deep do we need to go. And we really needed to define what does an apprentice person look like, what does a journeyman person look like, and what does a master you know, look like. And this, so I use Visio for this, and this became the litmus test for any kind of development work that we do for training. So somebody comes to me and they say, hey, can you put together a class on XYZ? I'd go to this first, and I'd say, OK, where would that fall, that particular class? If it was on there, great. Then I'd map it to that, that block. So this is kind of a high level. If it wasn't, I'd ask myself, well, should we be teaching it you know, in, our, in our realm? And if we should, then I might be missing something up here on my, on my map. And so we've done this with our onboarding for customer care. So now we've got defined apprentice level, sort of journeyman level, master. We've, we're, we're in the process of doing it for our sales guys. And then anybody, any distributor, we've got all of this content as sort of that rote information, and it's predominantly online. Then this becomes a blending of online and classroom, right? And mastery starts moving up into the service and repair, where you get into the high end. That's a little bit of online, predominantly classroom and lab. Uh, we built for our assets, we built a, a database to track all of the assets, and we use that. You'll see soon on the Victor website, we're redoing our training page. It's actually in beta right now. And all of the courses that we 
uh, make for our end users and for our uh, distributors are going to be available with no logon. So just directly to the website, you can search by brand, you can search by uh, application, or you can do a keyword search, and you'll be able to pull up any, any bit of training assets that we have. So in order to do that kind of search functionality, we had to get really organized, and we just built an access database to make it pretty easy to do that. Captivate's one of the tools that we use for developing our online content. If you ever get into building your own online content, this is a pretty easy tool. It's sort of like PowerPoint on steroids, you know, so you can make really nice online uh, integrated content. We try and keep our online content to five to seven minutes. So again, it's real bite-sized chunks, and we build it very modular. So the idea is, um, in our world, take for example some of the apprentice stuff. If I'm talking um, gas storage, so gas storage has application in welding, it has application in plasma, it has application in, in Victor oxyacetylene. So now that one module with very little modification I can utilize across multiple, you know, multiple elements and that breadth of information that I need to teach. So we, we structured the whole thing to be modular so we could get the biggest bang for the buck of stuff that we make online. This, <laughs> if any of you use a smartphone, a tablet, a PC, and you've got files that you need to transfer back and forth between the two, this is probably my most used um, application. It's a, uh, it's, it's a shared folder where basically you can drag a file into it and it automatically syncs to whatever dice, device you've got Dropbox on. So I do graphic manipulation on my tablet quite a bit. So I'll manipulate it on my tablet, drag it into Dropbox, take it into my PC, put it in Adobe Captivate. Sometimes I'm working at home, so I'll put it in Dropbox, pick it up on my home PC and start working on it there. It's just a seamless transition. It's an app you can download on any, any mobile phone, and then you can download and put it on your PCs too. Very, very useful tool. Here's the smart boards. So our classroom, uh, we're gonna be building a new training uh, center or facility at, uh, at Denton. And we're changing the classroom to kind of model the whole environment. So we're getting away from this format. We're getting away from the lecture where I, I stand up. If you were to go into our classroom, it'll be pod based and there's no discernible front of the room. So we'll have smart boards on at least three of the walls, okay? And all of the class is about engaging, right, with either online content, working in the lab. If we lecture, it'll be, uh, you know, a lecture where the instructor, the whole class is built for more interaction from the instructor. So instead of standing up here away from you, I'll be able to move throughout the crowd and facilitate and work on the groups as they're working on all the, all the content. So we are really moving away from the lecture format uh, al almost completely. This is one of many QR code makers. So these cool QR codes here that you can, up and you can go up onto uh, Azon Media and um, make them for free. So uh, it's very, very easy. You can uh, actually do contact information. You can do references to websites. You can do, there's all kinds of stuff that you can pull up. And again, this, is, this will be on that um, USB pen that I'm gonna give you guys. And then the other thing is tablets. There's a whole ton of tablets. The gap is really uh, narrowed down between the, the tablets. Our particular industry, we got iPads, so we build everything uh, iPad friendly. But we aren't doing apps. We're actually leveraging HTML5 and JavaScript, and we're trying to design so that regardless of what device hits it, you'll be able to, you'll be able to use it. So what we don't want to do is get into the app building business where I got to build an app for the iPad and then I got to build it for uh, Android and then I got to build it for a PC. So we just want to build it in a web form so that whatever device you're using when you hit it, you'll be able to render it and run it. There are some helpful conditions if you're going to try and really get your organization to embrace technology and move into this. Uh, first off is it helps to have some executive buy-in. I'm very, very fortunate that uh, my boss uh, in the C-suite is pretty forward thinking and has let us kind of run loose with a, lot of this, uh, with a lot of this stuff. So it's very helpful to have some support from, uh, from your administrations and high up. You also got to check and make sure that you, your IT is capable. You've got IT support and not only IT support, but you have an infrastructure that will work with what you're trying to do. 
All right, I learned this lesson the hard way when I first tried to introduce MS project, enterprise level project, to our organization. At the time, there's a bunch of assumptions that I made that our infrastructure is strong enough, that we've got the same technology across the globe, that we use the same terminology with all of our resources. None of those things were true. Right? We weren't integrated with any of it. Our network was terrible. Um, so this, this great software never really panned out for us. We could never use it because we just didn't have the resources. So you want to pick and choose and make sure you choose technology that will work inside your, uh, your environment. Because one of the most frustrating things is putting something out that doesn't work, especially if it's new. You know, if it doesn't work, then you'll, you'll, you, you'll get people that will not embrace it. And then having willing students. One thing that the flip model really does, and getting any, any kind of individualized course or self-paced uh, study, is it puts the onus back on the student. And this is probably the thing I learned most from my, um, uh, my friend who's teaching at the community college teaching math, is there are some people that are very comfortable letting the instructor take all the blame. So, they want to just kind of sit and coast through. The flip model is not a coasting model, right? So she's changed that homework to prep work. If you don't do your prep work, when you come in to do the real hands-on work, you're, you're not prepared. And for some people, that's been difficult. Now, what she's seen, though, is for the people that embrace it, they love it. They're, they're angry that when they go to their next class, it isn't hers. They don't, they don't do that. They're not in the flip model. She's seen engagement in the classroom unlike before because now she probably spends more time with teachers' assistants, other students who are excelling in particular areas that can loop back around and can help the other students. Yeah, go ahead. How does she, uh, how does she deal with students that aren't prepared when they get to class? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. So. She spent, and this is actually what our topic is going to be about if we speak at FlipCon 14, is how do you create a culture in the classroom that, that really makes the flip, the flip classroom work? Um, so what she's found, I'm going to move out here to questions because that's right where we are. Uh, what she's found is that it's becoming self-regulating. So she shared with me a story just the other day where she had a student who's sort of one of the students that doesn't want to do the prep work and and was in one group, the person that uh, he was paired up with, um, she got frustrated and uh, Alice, my friend, was like, well, pick another group. And so she did, she left and picked another group and this guy was kind of left on his own. And she overheard in a conversation where he was talking to one of his students, the guy that wasn't preparing, and was asking, you know, what are we doing? How do you do this? And the kid turned to him and said, well, did you do your prep work? And he was like, no, nah, I didn't really have time. And he said, look at all these notes. I spent all night doing prep work. You gotta do your prep work, you know, or I can't, I can't help you. So the students are starting to regulate inside and pull the people up who don't want to, uh, who don't want to do the work. So you still got a percentage of students that no matter what, you know, they're, gonna, they're gonna blame the instructor or oh, it's a bad system or whatever, but she's getting phenomenal results. And she said her classroom is transformed. It's a completely different environment. She'll come walking in and already the students will be broken up in their groups. There'll be all kinds of you know, topics, people will talk and stuff like that. She's even had other instructors that came in during class at the beginning and they thought that it was just pre-class banter that was going on in the classroom. And so they came in and started doing stuff and Alice was like, uh, excuse me, we're, we're in class. It's just that's, that's how dynamic the environment was. His kids were really, really engaged, right? Because it's just, it's a different, it's a different way of learning. But the onus does fall back on the uh, on the student. So, any other uh, any other questions, thoughts, comments, perspectives? Yeah, I really really wish I would have had that model. <laughs> yeah, me me too. Yeah, me too. Uh, it's um, it, Khan Academy, if you get an opportunity, go up there and look at what they're doing with their summer schools. So Khan is taking not only just the flipped classroom, but he's taking the next step beyond. And they've actually created a brick and mortar school that they're doing the project-based mentoring type of training in the, in the classroom. So online 
theory lecture, and then the whole class is built around that hands-on engaging type of stuff, and they're seeing some really, really incredible results. So if you get a chance, go up to Khan Academy and check out um, the uh, coaching uh, area is where you'll find it. That's where you'll find some of these tools that are available, their whole packages that they're developing for you. Yeah? Yeah, what well, they, uh, they have, um, I, I know that they have people on their staff that work with educational um, organizations for stuff like that. But I would tell you first, go up and, and check out. They've built their math around modules, and uh, they've got this universe map that breaks out the entire math from basically single digit addition all the way up to the higher concepts. And because it's module, you can go through it in whatever order you want. So you could pick and choose you know, the videos that you want, and you could just assign those videos, and they're already there. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you know, that, that would just sort of you, require you to kind of rethink how you want to deliver that math, look what they've got available. And they're not the only ones. There are other people out there that have online videos. Alice didn't like some of the, um, some of the concepts that she was teaching. She didn't like how Khan delivered them, so she found some other, some other online resources. So there's other places to go, but I've never seen one as, as you know, completely organized as it is in Khan. So I check out the site, but they definitely have some uh, resources you might be able to go to.